Hello and welcome to the Demo Day 2021 of the Wikimedia Accelerator Unlock. Please settle in, make yourselves comfortable. We are very thrilled to have you with us here today. My name is Lucia Obst. I am the program manager of the Unlock Accelerator, and I will also be your host for this afternoon. Now, why are we here today? The Demo Day very much marks the ending as well as the highlight of a very intense journey. Over the past three months, five project teams from across Europe and beyond have been working intensely to build solutions on rebuilding trust in the digital age. Not an easy task indeed. And today we'll be fully dedicated to the teams as they present to us their program results. We have five very diverse showcases lined up for you. So we invite you to be inspired, to be supportive, but also to celebrate their accomplishments with us. We will start today by giving you a brief introduction to the program as a whole, as well to the five project teams. Afterwards, the stage will be fully theirs as they present to us their showcases. We seem to have a technical issue. I'm not sure. Um, okay, it's just my screen that went off, which means I'm not sure um, what is uh, what you are seeing, but I'm sure we are still live, so I'm going to continue on with my moderation. Please excuse the delay. So I'm just going to repeat just for a moment the schedule for today. We will be briefly introducing the program unlock for you as well as the five project teams. Afterwards, we will give the stage to the five project teams as they showcase their prototypes. And later, we will also have a very brief look at what role all of us here might play in the further development of the projects after the demo day. But before we get started, I would like to know who here is actually in the space with us. Um, so I invite you, if you like, to post in the chat, which is on your right hand side over here, and share with us one or all of the following things. Where are you calling from geographically? Which room are you currently in? And which organization do you represent? So for me, this would be, I am in a very gloomy Berlin, Germany. I am currently in an event space and I represent Wikimedia Deutschland. So please type away if you like, um, share with us uh, where you are calling from, which room you are in and which organization you represent. Please only share what you actually feel comfortable sharing. And we do welcome all of you here today with us. I'm going to have a brief look at the chat. I see some people typing. Not much, um, not many messages coming in yet. If you don't feel like sharing too many information, that is all right as well. We do welcome everybody here and we also invite you to use the chat throughout the entire demo day. I can see here Berlin is represented as well. Some um, colleagues here too. Another Berlin, a lot of Berliners here today. Welcome to all of you. Bolivia, wow. From Rising Voices, welcome to you as well. People calling in from the Netherlands. We do have quite an international group here. Also some the other parts of Germany. Welcome to all of you from Paris as well. This is great. So many international people joining here today. I can see from several nonprofit organizations as well. Welcome to all of you. This is a great way to introduce yourselves to each other as well as our project teams. Please continue to use the chat um, also to ask any of your questions throughout the demo day. Um, and with that, I would like to move on to introducing you just very briefly to our program Unlock. 
Unlock was actually launched only last year by the German chapter of Wikimedia, Wikimedia Deutschland, um, with the aim of promoting solutions that make the world's knowledge more inclusive and more accessible to everyone. Now, I'm pretty sure most of us here probably know the online encyclopedia, the Wikipedia, but also many other very successful Wikimedia projects have started together a massive movement fighting for free knowledge in recent years. And the Unlock Accelerator actually very much aspires to continue to drive this movement forward. And how do we do this? We do this by supporting innovators and change makers who are actively working on new products and new services to help improve the free use of knowledge across the globe. So our mission is we accelerate your ideas together. We build the future of free knowledge. Earlier this year, what we did is we kicked off the second edition of the Unlock Accelerator, and we did this by setting out a challenge. A challenge to find new project ideas on how to make the world's knowledge, or how to, let me rephrase that, sorry, on how to re-strengthen trust in information and trust in technology. We have seen that the digital revolution, climate change, societal megatrends, but also a global pandemic have been taking over our lives and have started to greatly influence the way that communities and societies actually come together. And this in turn means that the access to trustworthy and trusted knowledge sources, as well as the informed and competent use of information has become increasingly challenging for users and consumers alike. And this is where our challenge comes in and why we set out to find new project ideas on how to counter these trends and how to make a positive impact on building trust. Luckily, we were successful in our search and from all the applications that we received, we did select five promising teams, each with their very own idea of how they can make a contribution to building more trust in information and technology. Now, we did not do this on our own, of course. We did have some help, and each team was actually paired with one or two coaches um, for very one-on-one -on -one needs based individual coaching sessions. And we also had several experts come in for input sessions. So a big shout out goes out to everyone who supported us. And especially we can see them here, Fabian, Ivana, Elio, Clara, Bernd, Eileen, Sabrina, Florian, Veronica, Michael and Mana and also a lot of others who are not depicted here. Thank you so much for lending us your expertise, your skills, as well as I do want to mention your never ending positive can do attitudes that really did rub off on the teams. I actually find that the teams this year were particularly e eager to keep learning and to really fully embrace those collaborative moments of support and exchange. So thank you so much much. Now, I do hope that maybe all of us here today could also join in on this positive supportive energy. And with that, I would like to finally finish up this monologue and introduce you to the participants of the Unlock Accelerator 2021. So please do um, join me in a virtual applause. I'm pretty sure we've all learned how to do this over the past one and a half years. Um, as I welcome to the stage Jan, Maren, Sergio, Subasic, and Anne Lee. We have here with us right now um, one member of each team with us, and they will briefly introduce us to their projects before we head into the, the more detailed showcases. So I'm going to start off with Jan. Good to see you. Hello. <laughs> You and your teammate, Albin, you're actually based in Sweden and the Netherlands, and together you have built Gov Directory. Please introduce us to your project. Yes, so the Gov Directory is a crowdsourced and fact-checked directory of official governmental online accounts and services. 
It's built on Wikidata and it's co-curated with the Wikimedia community and it's the easiest way to contact your government. Yes, thank you. You just told us that um, your platform pulls its information from Wikidata, which is the largest online free database. Can you tell us what led you to choose Wikidata as the source for your data sets? First, there's already a lot of data in Wikidata, so we could take some advantage of that when we built it. It also has a great API and perhaps most important of all, a great community, very friendly, easy to work with. And they're already working on this, so we're helping each other out here. It's a win-win situation. Love to hear that. Thank you so much, Jan. With that, I would like to move on to Maren. Welcome to you as well. You and your team, there's five of you who joined the Unlock Accelerator in total. You have been going back and forth somewhere between France, Germany, Portugal, the Netherlands, and Switzerland, if I'm not mistaken. And amidst your very, very busy schedules, you actually managed to build a tool that helps strengthen democracy. Please tell us about Follow the Vote. Yeah, hello there, everybody. Thank you, Lucia. Um, we are the team of Follow the Vote, and our mission is to bring political education to the 21st century by making it simple, factual, and fun. And with our app, we bring the core of parliamentary debates in a playful way to your smartphone. And more than 24,000 German citizens have already downloaded our app for the German election. And believe me, this is really just the beginning. And I warmly invite you to join us later so we can show you our MVP, which we will, um, which we develop for the German election, as well as our new app. So you get your daily dose of democracy from now on. And hopefully the only question remaining is then when will you start to follow the vote? Thank you. You did um, launch the app right before the German elections, the Bundestagswahl, which was two weeks ago. But the app is not intended to be only an election aid. Can you give us a little sneak peek of your ambitions for the app following the vote? Oh, sorry, following the elections yeah. by following the vote. <laughs> sure. Exactly. Um, as you said, two weeks ago, we have helped young citizens to prepare for the federal election. And now we need to make sure that all of our users start informing themselves about politics every day um, and for the rest of their lives. And um, this is why our latest version enables users to literally follow the vote. This means that every day you will be updated about the most important laws, news and also petitions. Thank you so much. We look forward to more details in the showcase. And with that, I would like to ask Sergio to the stage. Hola to you. Your team is based in Spain and France. Sergio, why don't you tell us about Think Twice? Hola, hola, Lucia. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, we are uh, Think, Tw Think Twice, um, David from France, Constant, and me, Sergio from Spain. And we are developing a set of applications built upon a knowledge quality framework that will help us to reduce intoxication uh, and generate trustable knowledge more efficiently. Thank you. As part of the Unlock Accelerator, you actually developed a browser extension to help mm. highlight text, as well as an underlying mechanism to support the evaluation of text. Will you be addressing both of these aspects in your showcase? Yes, uh, we will. Um, the browser extension will be a practical demo since we already have a working MVP. And regarding the nature of the framework, um, uh, we will introduce it as much as possible uh, for something to be understood, but not as much as it is uh, overwhelming. Uh, but still, it will require your maximum attention so you don't miss any detail. <laughs> Thank you so much. I guess we will get the full picture. Thank you for that. Dear Subhashish, welcome to you as well. You are on your own today calling from India as your teammate from France unfortunately cannot be with us here today. So I pass the virtual mic on to you. Please tell us about Open Speaks. Thank you, Lucia, and thank you everyone for joining today. Um, uh, so OpenSpeaks is uh, an open toolkit uh, which is hosted on Wikiversity, one of the Wikimedia uh, projects or a sister project of Wikipedia. 
And um, the toolkit is for um, archivists that are documenting uh, low resource languages uh, as audio and video. Uh, so as part of the Unlock program, what we did is we expanded uh, that to create more resources for people um, that are documenting languages uh, so that they could publish their uh, audio or video uh, outputs um, as more accessible uh, resources so people, can, uh, people with disabilities can access them. Yes, you actually talk of archivists. Can you tell us more about whom you are referring to when you say archivists? Mm -hmm. So, so archivists is is a very um, sort of umbrella term that that we use. Uh, anybody who is archiving a language is an archivist, and in this um, context, is people who are creating audio and video content in different languages. But the focus uh, primarily has been uh, on people that are. Uh, documenting uh, languages which are indigenous languages or endangered languages or languages that have le less resource, uh, languages that might not be official languages of a state or uh, a dominant languages. So, so mostly minority indigenous and endangered languages. Perfect. Thank you for the explanation mm -hmm. and your introduction. Lastly, we have Anne Lee here with us, working from Switzerland and the Netherlands together with your teammate Miriam. You have also been working on a browser extension. Please tell us about the resource project. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, the resource project is a research project, um, a browser extension, which we're excited to talk to you more about later today, um, as well as an emerging open data community. Um, we pair investigative research with open data about labor issues and corporate social responsibility statements to really help people cut through corporate jargon. Um, our goal is to combat disinformation in the supply chain and ultimately to support workers. Thank you. You actually, I remember this well, you joined the Unlock Accelerator with the intention of building an online repository and then somewhere along the line you took a step back and decided to go with a browser extension instead. Can you tell us what the motivation for this decision was? Well, we realized pretty early on in the program that we needed to kind of take a step back from the systems approach that we had taken as research into much smaller scale micro approach in product development. And it was really quite organically through the process of user research and conversations that we had with activists, with organizers, with researchers, with um, developers that we realized that a browser extension could be a way for us to kind of share information that the complexity of the supply chain uh, in a much more public facing and accessible way. And we really loved uh, the possibilities that came with building one. So we're excited to talk about it later today. Yes, so are we. Thank you for sharing. And thank you to all of you actually for your introductions and giving us a little impression of what your project is all about. I'm pretty sure we all have some more questions and are ready to dig a little bit deeper. So this is how we will actually be organizing the next 30 minutes of the demo day. So all five project teams will now leave this main stage that we are currently in and head into separate stages, what we call the exhibition rooms. And you can see all of these in the navigation menu to your left hand side. At the very top, you should see the main stage, which is where we are in right now. Below that, we have the exhibition room one, which is where Gov directory will be heading. In exhibition room two, we have follow the vote. Exhibition room three is reserved for think twice. In exhibition room four, we have the resource project. And in the last exhibition room number five, that is where you will find open speaks. Now, in their respective exhibition rooms, each team will provide you with more information on their project in a little presentation. They will also answer any of your questions and they will give you a live demonstration of their prototype. So actually click through those and show you how they work, which is very exciting. Each showcase will have a duration of 15 minutes happening at the same time, which means you, dear guests, are able to choose which showcase you would like to join. Once the 15 minutes are up, we will go into a second round of showcases, giving you the chance to move through the space and join another demonstration. 
This showcase will also have a duration of 15 minutes, which means in total we have two rounds of showcases, 15 minutes each. And once the 30 minutes in total are up, we will get back together here in the main stage, where we will get a little sneak peek of where the projects are headed next and how we can support them. Speaking of support, my team here in the background, as well as the five project teams, will help you navigate through the space. And for now, I would just say, please pick one of the five exhibition rooms and enjoy the showcases. Indeed. So Jan and I are here to present our project Govern Directory, which aims to be the easiest way to contact your government. And sort of the, the main question is, how do you try to find uh, contact information to your uh, government? How, what's the way to take contact? If you have a question like, which were the countries Norway exported war materials to in 2019? Yeah, or another example of a question like that would be, who were the largest CO2 emitters in Sweden? So how, who do you ask this question to? And when and where do you do it? And that's where we come in. Uh, we want to get your voice heard. This is the easiest way to contact your government. And when we started this journey, we kind of needed to design on the target group or prioritize beyond the groups we had. And we decided that the target group would be the active citizen or the activist we might know them not. It might be young people protesting for climate change or people interested in how countries export war materials and so on. And we also found that when we had all this data presented, there are also other target groups that might be interested in this, like journalists or data journalists. But we try to focus on the activist is our main target uh, user for it. So our solution to this is a crowdsourced and fact-checked directory of official government online accounts and services, uh, built on top of Wikidata and co-curated by the Wikimedia community. And this is, for now, the place to start conversations. It's where you take the first step, uh, where you find your government agency uh, who you want to contact about your issue, or if you want to make them uh, public, uh, contact them, them online and put some pressure on them, or you can just uh, contact them by mail or, or phone. And very early in this project, we decided for a vision, and that is, a world where people are empowered to engage with the government to ensure responsive, reps, inclusive, participatory, representative decision making at all levels. And that is directly and actually partly quoted from the Sustainable Development Goals, and in particular, Goal 16 about peace, justice, and strong institutions. And the features that the Gov Director have is it gives you a basic uh, information for context so you know in where this is in the hierarchy it will list all the online accounts and services that you can find you can search in two different ways either you can go in by topic or you can do it by country and we have provided a way to give some feedback or suggest improvements and all the data is in wikidata it's community curated anyone can edit it and with that, let's see if the, uh, the live demo will uh, work. Uh, it is live on govdirector.org, so you don't really need to sit and wait for us, but I'll, I'll show you around here uh, how it looks. So I, this is the web page as it looks. You can see we have the countries and topics like we talked about. and. Well, actually, borrow the just the questions here as well. And for now, we have eight different countries' data being pulled online. We do some sort of quality assessment before we actually put it on the website. Uh, not all the countries have all the data right now. So let's take the question about uh, war materials. And for instance, if you will, would want to look at United Kingdom, 
uh, right now we only have the departments, but that might be the Ministry of Defense uh, being responsible for that question. So you can check out, and all this data comes from Wikidata. We see the official website. There's no phone number right now, but we see who's leading this. This is probably the minister. Uh, you have a link to Wikipedia, an uh, edit button that leads to Wikidata, and they're available on two different platforms, Twitter and YouTube, so that if you want to go online and talk to them. And then if you were thinking about the other question that we talked about, the uh, carbon dioxide, well, then you would head into the topics perhaps, because you remember the flower and the environmental protection. These are the categories from the United Nations Statistics Division, so it's nothing we came up with. Uh, and for Sweden, then, you, you would see, well, yes, probably the Environmental Protection Agency. So you click your way in there, and a little bit more information for them. You see the parent organization. There is a phone number if you want to call the. Uh, there's also their main regulatory text. They have an email and seem to be quite an online agency. So you can choose where you want to go. Maybe you even can find some raw data in their GitHub directory, who knows? And I think, yeah, so each country is right now, you can click around and yeah, let's perhaps head back to the presentation here. So quickly about me and John, who for the last three months have been working on this project during the Unlock Accelerator. So we are two open knowledge enthusiasts with a bit of roots in the Wikimedia movement. Uh, we have both been working for public organizations, both at the national level as well as the European level. And yeah. And what's the competition that we have? Well, <laughs> we wish there wouldn't be a need for a Gov director. We wish this was already available everywhere. Unfortunately, only a few countries have anything similar to this, but the most don't at all. Uh, so until there's something else available, we will be here for them. So we don't see any real competition for on a global level right now. And, and, and as I mentioned previously, we have been doing this during Unlock. We actually, we had a bit of an ID, but it has changed during time, mainly because we very early settled for a vision, which we previously presented. And based on that vision, the project has rather formed around that, rather than us having the technical idea about using Wikidata for a project like this. So it has kind of gone beyond Wikidata and rather be about the citizen rather than the data itself. We also very early started with a technical prototype as well as with a bit of community work, which now has led to that we have these eight countries online. So as Alvin said, eight countries and in right now it's almost 2000 agencies and almost 5000 contact points. With contact points, we mean uh, one email address or a Twitter account or something like that. Each of those are a contact point. So in on average, there's a little bit more than two per each <laughs> right now. But that's also because there's a lot of work to do to add these kind of contact points. It hasn't been the main priority from the Wikidata community so far to add the social media for agencies. So but even there are lots of opportunity to do it. And this project is not only built on top of Wikidata, but it's also built by a community and it's open source. The data that comes from Wikidata is of course under CC0, which is all the data, but the actual source code is also under CC0. And we try to make the community as open as possible. It's both on GitHub as well as on Wikimedia itself or on Wikidata. And we hope that anyone can join and edit if they want to. And we have seen quite a lot of edits so far to, to our data set that we have uh, uh, monitored. There's almost 2,000 edits to the code uh, around 150. And over 150 editors were poking on this data in September, which doesn't necessarily mean they know about our project, but they were still uh, contributing to it so that we uh, can show things in in the platform. So, currently, this is a part which 
we have been working for the last three months and we have been very supported by uh, Vic Media Deutschland here and the Unlock Accelerator. But for now, it's rather sustainable. It's currently hosted for free on GitHub, but we're investigating moving it to a bit of a more, more Wikimedia centered servers. Uh, the analytics, we have super privacy friendly analytics. Everything we collect is even public, and that's provided by Wikimedia Sweden to us. And it was initially supported by the Unlock Accelerator, as we have been mentioning throughout. And thinking about the, the future and the outlook, we see several different uh, packages we can add on. Uh, as Alwin said, the sustainability for itself is kind of good, uh, but we're thinking about something like we can add on more uh, helping hand, a guide to the citizen who is doing this. How do you write a freedom of information request? And how, how do you question for, um, like what, what, are, what are possible questions that you can ask for your government? And that could be one package. And another one could be empowering our editing community, giving them more powerful tool to both add data and monitor it because we want this to be high quality. And we want to double down a little bit on that. We want this to be open, open source and free to use and community driven. And in particular, John and I doesn't see herself as owner of this product. We have merely facilitated it in its beginning and we do not claim any ownership or such over it. And I guess that's it for now. You can go explore at govdirectory.org or you can contact us uh, on the details you see here below. We're on the web. And we also have a few minutes for you to ask uh, questions now in the chat if you like to before we start the second round. Um, Madalena, do you want to take over? Yes, sure. Welcome, everybody. Um, as you know, elections may take place every four to five years, but democracy is every day. Therefore, Follow the Vote provides you with your daily dose of democracy. Follow the Vote is a project from the nonprofit Political Innovations Association, which is an independent and nonpartisan organization. Let me briefly guide you through today's agenda. We start by presenting our team and values. Next, we will, we will explain the MVP that we have built during the Unlock program for the federal German elections of 2021. And then it is showtime. We will show you our actual product for the elections. Further, we will discuss how our tool helps young citizens after the election and give you the opportunity to try our latest version. Let's start with our Unlock team. Maren and Frank are our business experts, leading the strategic decision-making processes, planning and building non a sustainable nonprofit while working creatively on designing the front end of the app and our PowerPoint presentations, because of course that is what business students do, right? Then there's Elena and I, the heads of the political content team. We are two political science students with different professional experiences and complementary fields of interest. May it be European studies, international relations, or legal studies, we have been through it quite successfully, even in times of a pandemic. The fifth team member you can see here is Levi. He is building alliances for democracy, upholding relationships, and taking care that everyone knows about what we do and why we do it every day. He is our communications and PR genius with a lot of experience. All these competencies and our team spirit were explored, improved and deepened throughout the last three months, working intensively within the accelerator program of Wikimedia. However, behind Follow the Road are many more dedicated volunteers than just us five here. Let me present to you the Follow the Road family. A group of engaged students and early professionals that strive for political inclusion, free education and open code and open knowledge. We are lucky to have future teachers, political scientists, journalists and of course app developers on board. So what do all these individuals have in common? 
why do they put their free time into follow the vote? Because we are working to combat the political disengagement of young citizens. And we believe that the only way to do this is to bring politics to the 21st century by building an independent, transparent and innovative digital space for young citizens. And therefore, we embarked on a mission in January 21 to create a web application that helps young citizens to engage with politics in an easy, factual and fun way. So during the Unlock program, we have made an application for young citizens to prepare for the federal elections of 2021. So how? There are three components, the government, voters, and an algorithm. Our political team dug into the archives of the parliament to trace back to most important laws that were discussed in the last four years. We transformed these laws into a statement. For instance, Germany should pay more money to defense. The voter decides what their opinion is. Now, algorithm compares the opinions of the party to the opinions of the user. Lastly, the voter receives a score to see how much they align with each of the political parties. What makes these two so special is that in our app, the position of the political party is determined by their vote in the parliament and not on the party programs as other two. So to summarize, we looked at four years of legislation and over 200 debates to eventually make 48 statements to determine where you politically stand. And on the 5th of August, we finally launched on the vote. So now please dim your lights, take a firm hold of your chair because it is showtime. So on the main screen, um, you can choose a statement. They read it, and this one is coincidentally about the NATO, which I introduced earlier with the defense um, example. We provide background information about the topic so that the user better understands the political tensions. And to form an opinion, we provide six arguments that the user can either agree or disagree with. These arguments are summaries of the standpoints that the political parties uh, gave in the, uh, in the parliament. This helps the user to form an opinion and is used by the algorithm to determine the alignments to each of the political parties. With all this information, the user is now able to make a well-informed decision. And afterwards, they can see what the political parties actually voted in the parliament. All of this information is combined in the political profile. Here, the user is able to see which party has the highest alignment. So, over the last seven weeks, we didn't only build an app, we also did a lot of marketing to make sure people know of our app. We made our own follow the vote beer courses, and it found a home in dozens of bars in Berlin and other cities in Germany. In addition, we had radio interviews and news articles. And as the cherry on the cake, we got a free advertisement in the Frankfurt Allgemeine, a very prominent newspaper in Germany. Besides our offline activities, we did online marketing to reach young citizens where they spend most of their time online. And we created our own Instagram account, which now has around 700 followers. And we use this channel to reach influencers that have helped us to reach even more people. So did all of this work? Well, in the seven weeks from the launch until the election, we have been able to reach more than 24,000 downloads. This has been a huge confirmation for the team and gives us the opportunity to think about the future. Exactly. So now let's look at what we want to do with these 24,000 users in the future. We have made a tool for the election. But we believe that this solution does not tackle the core of the problem, namely that many young people do not know what's going on in politics. And that is why we want to make political education part of our users daily lives. You might say, well, politics is already omnipresent and information is very accessible. But we say there are three worrying trends. Firstly, more than 70% of citizens under 30 use social media to inform themselves about politics. This means they are often exposed to low quality information. And secondly, our digital reality has become a space where we confirm instead of challenge our beliefs. And thirdly, we have become passive consumers of information. 
we often adopt opinions without taking the time to reflect them. And our application tackles these trends. The users receive high quality information every day. They then have the chance to form their own opinion by actively engaging with the given information. And finally, we leverage the power of technology by storing and analyzing the decisions our users make. If they reconsider their opinion, our app updates their political profile. Let's move from theory to practice and look how this works in the app. So let's start with follow the legislation. With this feature, we make the day-to-day -day business of politicians transparent and inform our users how the parties voted on the most recent legislation. The second pillar is follow the news. It's like reading the latest headline in the newspaper, but instead of passively consuming the news, we ask our users how they would vote on the political measure that is discussed. And as a special third feature, we follow petitions. With this, we take our user engagement one step further. Because you don't just form an opinion, you can actually do something with it. If you share the concern of the petitioner, you can use your voice and sign the petition. And last but not least, our users can follow their own progress. All decisions are stored in the political profile so that we empower our users to find their political identity. And now we invite all of you to actually get your phones out and to follow the boat, because what we have shown you here is uh, up and running. So this QR code brings you directly to our web version of the application and just try it yourself. So um, I hope everyone has, has their phone out, um, have their phone out already. Um, this was the presentation that we prepared for you. I hope you um, enjoyed it. Uh, again, so we are, hello everyone, um, uh, all the new people in the, in the room. Uh, we are Think Twice and uh, we are developing a system of applications to reduce intoxication and uh, and um, and uh, well, generating better quality knowledge and not a crash tool. Um, next. Yeah, so the, the, the problem, the main problem that we're trying to uh, deal with um, to reduce is intoxication. We think actually that intoxication is the main problem of humanity. Uh, for, I mean, we are, we are, I mean, it's not about a saturation of information, which is about quantity, but but about quality. So it's the, the, all these wrong representations that we just get and that we can digest. And so we have this all these representations that lead us to taking wrong decisions and um, ultimately uh, uh, wrong uh, social development or personal development. So uh, if we don't, um, if, if they don't block us to solve the problems, they they actually generate. But there's something that we actually have had since some time, um, since, since years ago, that we, we used to reduce intoxication, which is the, the highlighter. We, we, we normally stop uh, using it uh, because it's not worth it. We actually use a lot of, of, um, of multiple and uh, and confused and implicit and assumed criteria, but uh, the digital highlighter only allows us to, one, to use one and meaningful criteria at the time. So then uh, we end up uh, continue. Uh, we end up uh, not uh, using them, not reusing this. Um, uh, so what we have done is to uh, first uh, uh, thing that we have started doing is like trying to understand what is this thing of uh, calling information that is so important in our lives, but we haven't been taught uh, uh, what it is. And the thing is that it's more complex than it looks, but we have managed to to reduce and to extract like the four basic criteria that uh, actually make something informative. Uh, and we are going to talk, uh, well, they are pretty self-explanatory. You can see them there. But we are going to explain some, uh, a few properties that will uh, have to give you like more perspective of, or their, of their importance. So next. No, so one is that we are actually using, in, using it constantly, even when you tag something as a, 
an example, for example. So uh, you you do it uh, implicitly. You implicitly are assuming that this is uh, well, relevant for your targets. It's here, etc. The next uh, property is that uh, you can use this. Um, next slide, and you can use this criteria in any kind of non-fiction text. But the most important ones is that uh, these criteria are necessary all the for for something to be meaningful and at the same time they are sufficient with all the four you have you can say that what you're reading is actual information so my next slide uh, the, um, the advantage of this is that uh, you can use it as a filter for for separating information from what is not information and with this uh, i'm passing you to sergio who is going to explain you about uh, or first tool called Highpoint. Uh, thank you, um, Constant. Um, I'm going to take presenter, and then I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Okay. Um, so Highpoint. Uh, a smart highlighter for the web. Um, so you may be wondering, like, okay, these uh, four categories that uh, define the quality of the information, how do we actually like end up applying in the real world? Well, we have done a browser extension that uh, lets you highlight, or what we normally understand for selecting text, and then when you select text, uh, this uh, menu will pop up and show in these uh, four circles. Each one represents one of these four categories. And then by clicking them, you can apply any combination or of these four categories to your single standard highlight, um, boosting, boosting it up uh, to a new level. Um, but uh, maybe it's better if we see the extension in action so here we have a like a chrome uh, family uh, browser chromium or chrome or brave or any of these uh, browsers and we have done this uh, extension and when we are uh, navigating through a web page like this one in the wikipedia if we just uh, want to highlight uh, any sentence that caught our, our attention then now we will do as usual, but we will be able to um, apply uh, the, uh, the, 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 the the given criteria. Okay, so this, as you can see, now this select this uh, uh, selection has this uh, pop up related to it, and then we have these four buttons with the categories, and then we can start um, apply applying them. Okay. Yes, um, and then um, we can just, uh, let's say, put this combination of uh, uh, criteria, and then we have this this uh, text is selected with all this with this combination of criteria. So uh, going back to the demo, uh, to the presentation, uh, this uh, MVP is uh, uploaded to GitHub. It's open source, and um, you can uh, give it a try if you want to install it in your browser. Uh, more features, it's under development, so more, future, more features will, will come up. And now I will just uh, pass on uh, to this content of the Thank you, Sergio. So next functionality we want to, to present, uh, it's uh, what we call automatic claim detection. So uh, indeed, one thing I point allows is to retrieve argumentative point in text. So and more precisely, it allows to, to retrieve claims. Uh, the claims are the conclusive part of, of the argumentation in text. So uh, for example, here we can see a Wikipedia article, and in a click using I point, uh, we can retrieve uh, the claims in this text. So here we can see uh, three claims about uh, variance and video game as the theme of the article. And um, 
Then it also acts as a smart AI highlighting assistance, since you can uh, click on these claims that was detected. And uh, if you want to, you can add it into your own highlights, just as uh, Sergio showed to us uh, using your uh, own combination of criteria. Uh, and, uh, and that's it too. You can so easily add it into your own claim if you're interested, into your own highlights if you're interested. And another thing um, we allow is to see uh, more uh, part of the argumentation. For example, we can see the evidences uh, that are related with the claims. So here we can see these studies that will support uh, a specific claims, a specific claim. Um, so uh, for this, we created a, a machine learning uh, library. Uh, we call this the argument mining library. It's trained with Wikipedia data, with annotated Wikipedia articles. Uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, you can take a look, and uh, it's uh, it will be uh, improved in the in the coming uh, week, weeks. Uh, and so the value of doing that is that you can see objective in paper essay summaries. So you can see summaries uh, that are composed of the claims. So you can see what the author actually claims in a text. It's also an open door for argument analysis because the first thing you want to do for an argument analysis is to uh, see the argument, see the component of the argument in text. And uh, this uh, work of uh, argument analysis can help uh, in the script we want to do in the long term to build trust in, in what we read uh, on the web. So, Constantino, mm, that's your turn. Constantine, are you there? Uh, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so you have seen that there's an extension that uh, uses the, this wheel of these four keywords. But, and we have also, on the other hand, these, these things that uh, are like uh, extension two. Yeah. So uh, this first wheel that you have seen uh, corresponds to the the criteria that uh, depends on the reader, what is new for, uh, for one person, it's not new for another person, um, and the same with the other. But there are other criteria that also help to uh, find better quality information, which are, that would depend on the text. Yet, with these four basic ones that we have seen, we can differentiate what is information, what is actually informative with, uh, from what is not. These other texts um, related to the uh, criteria are uh, like more complex, um, but uh, we had to develop a tool for, uh, uh, sorry, a wheel for it too. Um, you have already seen that uh, the claims are, are uh, part of this, um, how they work. And for those seeing the rest of the, uh, and, and all the rest of the uh, framework, you will have to go to the web and see uh, a read of, uh, about it if you were really interested. Uh, but now what is important is that we have these, these two things and that the, the two corresponds, uh, the first one to what the human does and the second one, one uh, we are going to develop the same way we have done with the games. We are going to develop algorithms that help to reduce their cognitive overload and, uh, and do it automatically. So um, uh, next please. Uh, then, yeah, what's the benefit of using these categories? Well, um, well, there, there you can um, just see them, and uh, there's. Uh, the, I think the only thing that is uh, have to clarify here is that containers refer to uh, well folders, for example, are containers or articles, and articles contain uh, well different uh, sentences or units of information. So, and these four first criteria that you um, are um, applicable even for articles. We are going to see that um, instead of um, a sentence or something that you agree or with or not. Uh, but the two of them serve as a way to separate uh, information uh, from, I mean, good quality information from bad quality information. Next one. So it um, uh, seems not working if uh, very well. This, but uh, you could see at least that uh, uh, if you go, um, just uh, you can select, uh, you go to an article, you can select first the claims as, as mm -hmm. they said, show. And now you can click uh, on, on the first and then to, uh, like on clear and trust, and they will be automatically applied. You now click on apply, and then it's applied here to um, 
you can see my cursor, right? Uh, well, I'm assuming that. No. Uh, so then, uh, thing is, uh, well, you can apply this to the whole article, and so your assumptions are there, mm -hmm. and uh, that that will really help you to uh, uh, to reduce the number of clicks. Uh, you can even uh, just continue. You can uh, now select here, for example, yeah, the rest of them. Uh, you are going to most of the time you are going to use the four criteria, which are what makes something really meaningful. Uh, uh, so, uh, but you can also then click on the other uh, two uh, in the upper part next to that you can see the icon changes, and then the next one that you highlight, it's uh, uh, highlighted with the four criteria. See that we are highlighting, we are uh, we select automatically the, this. You don't have to go with the cursor from the beginning to the end. It is, it is um, selected automatically. This is, some, uh, this is another feature that we have and that makes highlighting more, more efficient. Uh, so just to sum it up, uh, adding to the filter benefits of the framework, we have uh, this multiple species marking. So you can mark once the clear layer. Uh, you can have objective uh, summaries automatically and you can, uh, you can highlight the much faster. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you everyone for uh, listening to us. Uh, we are hope you can. Uh, we are actually. Um, uh, I mean, if you are identified with these calls of reducing intoxication. You are more than welcome uh, to to join us. We are looking at the kind of people you can contact us. So, thanks a lot. OpenSpeaks is, uh, is an open uh, toolkit for archivists that are documenting low resource languages for uh, uh, low resource languages uh, in audio and video format. So that includes um, many people. That includes people who are uh, enthusiasts uh, that are creating audio or video documentation of their own language or a language that is spoken uh, close to them. And um, it includes um, uh, journalists who are interviewing people and are recording and are broadcasting that uh, on different platforms, web or TV and so on. And the focus primarily has been always for open space, languages that are low resource languages. So that includes indigenous languages, endangered languages, and, um, and any language that is not supported by uh, a lot of funding from the government uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, Initially, when OpenSpeaks um, uh, was created in 2017, um, it was created um, keeping in mind that people who are documenting languages might have some amount of understanding in, uh, of, of language documentation, and uh, they also know English to some extent. So um, the, the original OpenSpeaks project is actually a few thousand word um, <laughs> um, um, resource and it's, it's a massive resource in that sense but uh, when we start working on um, this particular uh, version we realized that it might be quite overwhelming so to test our assumptions we actually interviewed a lot of people and uh, one of them who is a new um, archivist told us that they are very overwhelmed when they landed on the page and they're trying to figure out where to start from um, and the the idea behind this uh, this project that we did under uh, the unlock program is to uh, make sure that the archivists that are creating documentations uh, audiovisual documentations know how to publish their audio and video materials as accessible resources that is accessible to people with disabilities um, for different challenges uh, with uh, with uh, accessibility. So, uh, so the, the first thing that we did is we, we had our own uh, notions of sorts, uh, but we tried to interview people and ask them what challenges that they face while documenting languages. So we interviewed people who are actively documenting different uh, low resource languages. Uh, we interviewed people who are working with uh, children um, while using uh, sign languages to teach children with disability. Uh, we talk, talk to people uh, that are creating um, other kinds of uh, language resources, for example, dictionaries or, um, or dictionaries that are actually multimedia dictionaries, so that have audio and video materials included in the dictionary and so on and so forth. 
we also interviewed people from different places. So my colleague uh, Leila uh, and I worked together on this project from the beginning. Unfortunately, Leila is not able to um, join us today. Um, but, but I think a lot of things that we um, sort of work together uh, are reflected here uh, in the new uh, version of this project. So, so this version of the project is primarily around accessibility. So the first three chapters that you see here are yet to be created and yet to be sort of linked here. They're then in uh, the development process. Um, so before I actually jump into the fourth chapter, which is about accessibility, um, let me also walk you through a little bit about the, the idea about this toolkit. Um, as I was saying, the toolkit is designed keeping in mind people who are documenting um, uh, low resource languages. Um, so, so not many people know about the proper process of recording. So some people might have done it uh, maybe a couple of times. Some people might not have done at all any kind of audiovisual recording. And the idea is to introduce to them uh, how it starts, where do they start from, what, what they have to keep in mind. Do they need to carry extra batteries when they're going for um, a field documentation? Or if they are doing a documentation um, because of COVID, they're not able to travel and they're doing the documentation online, how do they do that? Um, so that planning process is very critical, is very important, and what people have to uh, keep in mind. Um, the second um, chapter is about asking for consent or permission when they're actually recording, when they're actually documenting a language. So they might be documenting a language just by interviewing one person or two people, uh, but they might also be documenting, say, a group of people. And how do they ask for permission? There might be children visible uh, in, in, in their documentation. So how do they take parental consent? Um, and, and those things are generally not known to all the people who are documenting languages, but they're very important uh, from a legal uh, point of view, but also from um, an ethical point of view. So um, the next chapter is about copyright and giving credits. I'll quickly also jump into the chat just to ensure that everybody is able to see. Okay. Um, the, the, the next chapter is about copyrights and giving credits. So if somebody is creating a documentation, uh, an audio or video, and they sh they're sharing that on social media, for example, how do they attribute people that have participated in the uh, documentation process? So what they have to uh, take into account and how do they do that? What license do they use? Um, do they use a free license? Do they use a proprietary license? Uh, and how does it work? So, so that chapter is all about that. And all these three chapters will be available soon. Um, the fourth chapter, which is um, about accessibility, is currently um, mostly developed, but uh, I think there will be a lot more to add to this as well. Um, so this chapter is about how do content creators, how do archivists share something that is accessible to all the people? And not just people who have uh, who are able, uh, but also people who have some form of disability. So the two uh, sort of uh, sub chapters that are included in this are um, uh, what kind of solutions they have to build uh, when they are creating um, audiovisual documentation. Um, and one part is um, how do they make sure that people with hearing impairment, um, people who are deaf, or people who have some uh, level of difficulty in uh, with, with hearing, how do they access the content that they are creating? So um, and the, the design is such that there is a collapsible, um, this is a collapsible button. So um, the feedback that we received early on is that the current version of OpenSpeaks is quite uh, long and it's difficult to understand, difficult to comprehend. So we try to change, incorporate that feedback into our design. So right now, somebody who is landing on this page will see this much, which is not so much text. There is definitely some text, but it's not so much text. Uh, and when they click on a particular uh, segment, they will be able to see more details. But then if they have to go further into a particular segment, for instance, um, this particular uh, aspect um, that we see here is about um, something called closed captioning. So something that you see on YouTube, for example, when you enable the um, the CC um, button that is um, that is there at the bottom part of YouTube, bottom right part of YouTube. Um, so uh, what happens is when somebody is creating a subtitle, they can create in two different ways. One is they 
create um, the video and they sort of embed uh, the uh, the captions, the subtitles over the video file. So it's just one video file. The other way to do it is they create a video and create a separate text file, and then they uh, sort of add time code to the text. So when the text and the video are played together, the text appears over the video. So there are two different layers. So if somebody wants to change um, uh, or make some corrections or make a translation of the original text, they will be able to easily do that. Um, so how do they do that? And this part is also uh, created. So when they click on um, you know, that, that aspect, um, that particular segment about closed captioning, they will be able to see, um, they will be able to land in this page. Um, and they will be able to go back to the uh, open captioning, so which is basically burned in caption that I was talking about when the um, the captioning is basically embedded over the um, video. Now, there are different ways to uh, do closed captioning. So how do they do that? Um, and there are different um, devices that people are using. Some, somebody is using a phone, somebody is using a computer. Uh, and in this example, um, this is about uh, uh, an open source platform called Amara. And Amara is very useful because um, it is not only an open source platform or a web uh, platform, it's really powerful in terms of creating a community around translation of subtitles. So if I'm translating a particular video and I'm creating a translation in a particular language, I can invite people that speak different languages and they can translate into their languages. So this opens up um, sort of a, you know, um, a whole different world of translating content into different languages and making sure that people that speak those languages are able to access content in a different language because they're basically seeing the subtitles. So it's not just for people that have um, disability, but also for people that don't know a, a language that is spoken in a particular video. And, and this is how we share knowledge. This is how we ensure that everybody has um, access to content, access to information. Um, so that's about Amara. Now, going back, um, when we uh, look at the um, challenges that people face when they have visual uh, impairment and what is required for them. So in both the cases, what we have focused a lot on is what most archivists might not know. So they might not know what challenges people with uh, hearing impairment or visual impairment might be facing. So we introduce a little bit about the challenges that people face and how do they access the web? So for instance, when somebody has visual impairment, they're not using their mouse at all in most cases. They're using their keyboard and the tab um, button on their keyboard to go to different segments um, of, a, uh, of, a, of any content. So when it comes, uh, when it's, uh, say for instance, a blog, that has an embedded audio or video, uh, that blog content has to be formatted in a particular way. So they have to have um, things like um, headers. Uh, and headers help a lot uh, when somebody is accessing um, you know, uh, that blog or that website using their keyboard only. So they can basically use their tab button and then scroll through. So when somebody is adding a video, embedding a video into that, they should also add a little bit of text content so that um, the person who is accessing that content is able to um, listen to uh, the, the text content. So that's very important. So it's not just uh, adding subtitles, but it, it's also making sure that there are different ways to access the content. Um, and, and most people that are recording audio in, uh, in you know, outdoor uh, places, and they might capture a lot of background noise or they might capture um, noise that is unintended uh, and they need to clean that audio before uploading. So how do they do that? Um, so there's a tutorial to teach that. Um, so when they basically uh, click here, we're not sharing too much information in the very uh, first page, in the landing page, but we're taking them into um, separate uh, pages. And each of those pages are kind of independent. They're not, um, they're related with each other, but they're very independent. So if somebody is looking for information only about uh, editing voice, they will be able to go through this particular tutorial, which is available both, both as text and as video. And they will be able to um, um, install the software and make those changes. Um, they can keep this tab open while doing that. Uh, they could do all of that. 
if somebody wants to contribute to the project, they could also, uh, and we'll, we'll basically ensure that all these, uh, all these videos are available as um, videos without audio. So somebody who is interested to create a separate audio file, they could basically do that and create uh, another video file. So this video, this tutorial is also available in their own language. So anybody who is, um, who is trying to um, say watch and learn uh, and they don't know English well, they would be able to do that as well. So that's also creating a community around uh, this, uh, this practice. Um, so, so that's where we are right now. Um, we have uh, basically a landing page and all these links will be available soon. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I'm Miriam, and together with my dear collaborator, Anne, uh, we're going to be presenting the resource project, which is the culmination of what we've been up to during this Unlock Accelerator. So if you've been hanging out on your Twitter feeds or maybe reading the news lately, uh, I think these are some stories uh, that may look a little bit familiar. Um, and I think the past year, especially the past few weeks and the past week, uh, has really brought to the forefront how deeply reliant we are on global supply chains, uh, something that typically stays out of sight, out of mind for so many of us. And for those of you unfamiliar or vaguely familiar with the term, uh, supply chains refer to the activities that are required uh, to ensure the production and circulation of goods and services across the globe. And of course, What's so interesting about supply chains is that they only call attention to themselves and become visible when they stop working, as we've seen over the past couple of weeks. But this in itself raises uh, an interesting question about what it means for supply chains to be working or not, and who it is that we're really talking about when we say that they work or not. And so for us, what this highlights is two sort of different ways of understanding supply chains. On the one hand, you have supply chains as a science of management and logistical precision and of making sure that things uh, end up where they need to be as quickly, smoothly, and cheaply as possible. And on the other hand, you have an understanding of supply chains as a set of arrangements and principles that structure the lives and work of millions of people around the world um, and the rights that they hold or not in doing that work. And so what we're really interested in is um, how these stories are shaped uh, by different actors who mobilize in different types of information, how this information is then received by different publics, um, and how this all relates back to uh, the larger theme of trust. Uh, so with this as sort of background context for the project, I'm going to pass it on to Anne to tell us a little bit more about what we've been up to over this past year. Well, thanks, Miriam. Uh, so it's really by kind of combining and contextualizing these two ways of understanding supply chains, um, taking open data, audits, ranking, even impact measurements, and contextualizing them with open source investigations and open knowledge that we hope to help people to really kind of cut through corporate jargon to, to kind of be able to understand and tease out the contradictions between the two. So really, as I was saying before, um, the resource project is a research project um, that seeks to understand and, and learn more about these processes as they change and evolve over time. But in its forward-facing and in its public-facing form, it's a browser extension and a web application. And finally, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, it's an emerging open data community uh, that seeks to gather different repositories or types of information together. But really, we wouldn't be here uh, without the support of Unlock, and it's been uh, a crazy 2021. Uh, we kind of began the year with a series of workshops, uh, with a um, reading group that we began with other researchers, um, but a lot ch started to change in July. It was really in that first sprint that we realized um, that we needed to kind of de-scope, scope, take a step back into the kind of foundation of the project. Um, during sprint number two, that was actually when very completely the notion of the browser extension came into play. And then it was during sprint three, where you notice that kind of two steps forward uh, three steps back where we'd realized that we kind of needed to return to the foundations of the project after conducting a number of user testing sessions. But really, um, so much has changed even in the past week. We recently added a member to the team, Madeline O'Leary, who's coming to us from the Turns of Service Didn't Read a Privacy Project, 
um, who's joining us as our technical lead. And then we already feel like we have an incredibly strong uh, foundation to build off of in the coming months and beyond, which we're very excited about. But enough about the kind of foundation of the project. I'm going to pass it back on to Miriam to walk us through our tip demo. Yes, thank you. Um, OK, so I'm now going to run through sort of the details of the browser extension. Uh, I want to preface this by saying that there is a both a static prototype and also a more dynamic prototype that are in the works uh, being coded. But for the sake of today, we're going to focus a bit more on the kind of structure of the browser extension and the context. Um, and as you can see, the way that it works is uh, as a sort of pop-up modal uh, top right-hand corner of your browser, where most of your other extensions are likely to be. Uh, and so you would click on it and, and something will pop up and this is what I'll get into now. So um, starting with the first sort of panel that you would see, you have the title and then also the name of the company. And so the idea is that, uh, at least in this MVP form, that it um, is responsive to a given do domain that you're on, so Apple in this case. Uh, and so then the first thing you see just below the name of the company uh, is a snapshot of data that is taken from knowthej.org. Um, which gives you just some basic information about um, the company's supply chain. Uh, below that, there is then a, three, a tab structure of three tabs. I'm going to get into the second and third tab in just a second. Now, the first tab um, focuses on uh, the company's own uh, information that it provides about how it sees this question of working conditions across the supply chain. And so it'll be based off of uh, CSR sustainability reports of a given company, in this case, Apple. And then it's structured across subtopics uh, that we expected as a drop down. Remember settings. Uh, and looking a little bit more closely at what would happen if you clicked on one of the drop downs, the idea is that you would be presented with three types of information that uh, also pertain to the three different tabs. So the first thing you would see is the company's own statement on this topic, in this case, wages, benefits, and contracts. So how, how do they see this issue across the supply chain? Second piece of information that you would receive is whether there are any existing investigations that dispute this. And should that be the case, you'd be able to access uh, the source of that investigation. And then the third piece of information, which um, corresponds to a future iteration of the project that's beyond the scope of this MVP, that you would be able to see whether there is an ongoing resource project about that topic uh, regarding that company. And should that be the case, you'd be able to learn more about how to contribute to that. Moving on to the investigations tab, this is a different kind of information that is no longer from the company itself. Um, in this MVP iteration, we uh, rely on stories from uh, the Business and Human Rights Research Center, which sort of compile um, news, and it would be using their uh, RSS feed, um, and you would get uh, sort of investigative stories about the company uh, and labor conditions across the supply chain for the company, which would then be organized um, through topics and geography. And for the third tab, which we've tentatively called uh, RSC data as a play on both CSR and the resource, um, this tab relates to how we see the project. Uh, in the future. And so while we don't know exactly what it will look like, this is where we want there to be a space for crowdsourcing and open collaboration. And um, what's really important to us here is to not develop the project in a siloed way as a kind of standalone thing, but rather to recognize that there are uh, so many other existing efforts that also embrace this uh, open knowledge ethos uh, also about this topic. And we want to be able to work in tandem with them and sort of supporting and strengthening each other. And so two notable examples are uh, the Wikivert project, which is uh, an open data community that documents uh, CSR uh, corporate um, standards and behavior across the supply chain. And also um, the Wiki project, uh, Organized Labor, which seeks to expand Wikipedia coverage of uh, worker organizing in human history. But to talk to us a little bit more concretely about our next steps, I'm going to pass it back to Anne. Great. So really, what does that look like in real time? Well, in the short term, that honestly looks a lot like what we've already been doing over the past couple of months, uh, which is 
talking to as many people as you can, uh, doing more user research and testing as we kind of iteratively try to co-create features that will be useful for people within the universe of supply chain research and advocacy. And um, we also help to kind of begin to scaffold the process of what a crowdsourcing model could look like, um, as well as some live kind of data integrations through APIs in real time. Uh, we also applied for sources of funding to support us through that process. Um, in the long term, though, we hope to kind of be more actively integrated into the wider landscape of open knowledge and open data surrounding labor issues um, through groups like WikiRate, which Miriam had mentioned, as well as the Wiki projects and wider Wikipedia universe, as well as be regularly running workshops and other modes of contribution for people, um, as well as have, of course, our extension out in the universe. Um, the goal, of course, being expanding into other industries and developing web applications besides that. But with all of that being said, um, if any of this was interesting to you, uh, we would love if you got involved. Uh, there's so many ways uh, to contribute. We just are just getting started. We'd love to talk to you if you do work related to supply chains, if you're interested in testing our extension as we're in beta mode and real-time development right now. Um, you can follow us through our social media channels, whether that's on Twitter, joining our our um, mailing list or sending us an email. Um, but we're very, very open to uh, collaboration and we'd love to hear from you in, in real time. All righty, welcome back everyone. And well done, dear teams. Please everybody join me in another round of virtual applause for the teams. Thank you so much for taking us on your journey with you and also for being so courageous to actually take the stage and to trust us with your thoughts and your ideas. And this also means thank you, dear guests, for being so attentive and appreciative as well. I can see that the teams did receive several questions, some more in-depth questions about the projects themselves, some critical questions, but also a lot of praise. So I hope the teams were able to share with you their passion for good ideas and that they also have the power to actually implement those. However, no journey is complete without a look ahead. So what I would like to do is to ask the teams back to the virtual stage one last time for a very brief glimpse into the future. <laughs> now, what do I mean by that? We know that the teams have already achieved quite a lot, but the journey is really only just beginning. They have developed prototypes that are now ready for further development or maybe even implementation and scaling. So please welcome back Jan, Maren, Sergio, Subashish, and Anne Lee. And what I would like to know from each of you very briefly in just 60 seconds each, where do you see your project in three years time and what would you need now to get there? And I would like to start off with Jan once more. Hello, hello. Where do hello. you see Gov Directory in three years' time, and how can we help you make that a reality? Yes, so we mostly see that we want to scale in the data that is available through the platform and in Wikidata. And we hope that in three years, we can have half of the world's countries in there. And what we need from you to get there is to find the good and reliable sources. What is the national register for your country for this? And send that our way and we'll make sure to, to get it online uh, in an easy, accessible way. Thank you for sharing and being so specific about your needs. Dear Maren, tell us where is Follow the Vote heading in three years time and how can we support you? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we have a lot of ambitious goals. So in three years time, we want to scale up Follow the Vote on a European level. So firstly, Follow the Vote shall yeah, help millions of young citizens to help um, to become an active part of a digital democracy. We would like to have the application free and accessible for everyone in Europe. And we want to make it financially sustainable to, due to community donations. And um, thirdly, and lastly, Follow the Vote, um, content wants to be or should be maintained by and for young European citizens as an open knowledge community. 
And um, your second question, Lucia, how you all can help us to achieve that. Um, yeah, first and foremost, download the Follow the Vote app yourself, share it with your friends, and please, please give us feedback. And yeah, we are more than happy and grateful for any financial support. Um, but also, if one of you would like to join the Follow the Vote family, you can help us with programming, little cool features, formulating political content, or even advise us strategically if you are an ambassador of open knowledge and digital democracy. A lot of ways to get involved with Follow the Vote. Thank you so much. Dear Sergio, where do you see Think Twice in three years and how can we make that a reality? Thanks, uh, Lucia. Um, well, we have uh, already come a long way by the hand of uh, Unlock. Uh, but still uh, many things to do. In the short midterm, mid uh, not three years, but probably next month, um, we have many things to work on, like improve the machine learning algorithms, um, designing uh, uh, all the backend database models and uh, improving the extension and adding more functionalities and features. Uh, and, um, and also start building a, a community of users uh, focused mo mostly now gener on generating feedback, uh, uh, on generating feedback. Um, and um, well, what do we need to get there? Well, the, we need help, we need uh, people, developers, um, graphic designers, and collaborate all sorts of collaborators and users that can uh, test our um, solution and add feedback so we can uh, collect more data and tune up our models and so on and iterate on and on and on. Thank you very much, Lucia, and everyone. Thank you, Sergio. And Subhashit, tell us how far has Open Speaks come in three years' time and how can everybody here support you? Um, thank you, Lucia. So, uh, open Speaks being an open educational resource, um, there's, there are two uh, very important components. One is it's open, it's available for everyone to use it, but also to contribute. So if anybody is interested to contribute anything that they're an expert in, um, they're most welcome to join the community and then contribute. Uh, and that will be a permanent resource that will be available for everyone. That'll be open for translation. So that's the second aspect. Um, it's open for translation. If any, anyone is interested and they find it useful, uh, and they are most welcome to translate into their language. In fact, if somebody speaks a dominant language, an official language of a state, then it's a good idea to actually translate because in that way, many people from their own country who would be learning that language anyway in school and so on, will be able to learn from the resource and then use it. Um, so that's the second uh, area that uh, I'm really uh, sort of uh, looking forward to. The third is um, more user testing. And this is something that the core team would do uh, from our end, we'll reach out to more people that are uh, end users or are real users of such a resource and uh, and sort of gather their inputs and improve the project, uh, improve the overall quality of the pro of the content. Because without that, it will be a very static project and that's not the goal. Um, the goal is to ensure that the project is updated, it's, uh, it's useful, it's relevant, um, and, and it also captures the pluralism and the diversity that we see in the world when it comes to language diversity. Um, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. And Lee, you're up next. What will the resource project look like in three years time? And what can we give you to make that come true? Well, in three years time, we hope to be fully integrated and supporting and contributing to the landscape of organizers and organizations that are working on open knowledge related to labor issues. Um, we hope that more people, of course, will be using our extension, which will be fully out on the web um, in three years, way, hopefully way less than three years time. Um, and the way that you can help us to get there is really just by getting involved. Uh, this is really just the beginning. And we're always looking for people that are interested in running workshops with us, joining our workshops um, to learn more about supply chains in real time, becoming a contributor, a user tester, um, any sort of way you'd like to get involved, we'd love to hear from you. So the community uh, that we hope to, to build and contribute to is really wide open. Thank you so much. Lovely words to close with. 
Dear guests, we've heard it, a lot of very specific asks and needs. We are looking for contributors, users, testers. We need more feedback. We want translators and a lot of input from all of you. So let's help the teams as best as we can. Um, I know a lot have, has already been done, but um, and we here at Unlock, we're actually very, very proud of what the teams have already achieved. So it is also very important to us to know that the projects will continue on successfully. So if anything that you just heard resonates with you, if you feel personally addressed or you know anybody who could be of help on any of these aspects, please be sure to reach out. Either um, contact the teams directly or shoot us an email at unlock at wikimedia.de and we will be sure to forward. The email will also be in the chat. With that, once again, thank you, dear teams, for your showcases today. And with that, I would like to wrap up today's event. Thank you so much to all of you for joining. I do invite you to stay tuned over the next couple of weeks and months as we do updates or send updates on the projects as well as the program, both on our blog, which is on our website, as well as our Twitter channel, so be sure to follow along there. And I'm very excited that I'm allowed to announce that the Unlock Accelerator will continue in 2022 and head into its third edition. We are very excited and looking forward to sending you more updates on that as well. So stay tuned. Lastly, I would like to say just a very few words of thanks to absolutely everybody who made this demo day possible, as well as the Unlock Accelerator 2021, um, both on stage and behind the scenes. I have several people running around here, colleagues, partners, and crime. Thank you to all of you. A humongous thanks also goes out to my team. Hanika and Mia, thank you so much. And lastly, a special thank you to all of you. Thank you for joining us on this celebratory moment, the conclusion of the Unlock Accelerator 2021. Thank you so much and see you soon.